This is Steven Sargent back at Blockchain Futures Conference 2022. We literally have the crypto OG, Michael Perklin, board member of C4. Michael, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing now. Uh, hi, th thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Michael Perklin. Um, I used to work as the Chief Information Security Officer of Shapeshift, but when Shapeshift decentralized last year, now I'm just another member of the Shapeshift DAO. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to serve as the board member of C4 alongside other OGs like Andreas Antonopoulos and Joshua McDougall and Pamela Morgan. And I'm very happy to be here at the Futurist Conference. We appreciate it. That shapeshift now was huge news when it talked. Talk to us a little bit about what true decentralization means and how important it is for the crypto economy to get to that Web3 spot. Yeah, so um, at Shapeshift, we realized that the biggest um, problem, the biggest uh, hurdle that was getting in the way of our users doing what they wanted to do with their own crypto was the Shapeshift corporate entity itself. Um, uh, because Shapeshift was trading with all of our users, um, uh, we, we had to report all of their uh, KYC information to authorities. But we, we saw just how quickly DeFi was exploding and how each DeFi protocol was taking their, their own responsibility when it came to things like KYC. And it became obvious to us that the best way to serve Shapeshift's customers was to connect them directly with those DAOs, sorry, directly with those DEXs and let them uh, self-serve rather than us serve them. So in 2021, Shapeshift made the decision to shut down its corporate office, lay, lay off all staff, including myself, and uh, open source all the software so that uh, Fox token holders, uh, anybody who holds a Fox token, can vote on what gets added to the Shapeshift software next and decides the future of Shapeshift itself. That's awesome. Alex from Omnia Protocol, you're big into decentralization. How do you guys use privacy and still maintain decentralization using your products? Yeah, so basically what we do, we offer the incentive for anyone to spin up a node. We are a chain agnostic, so can be Bitcoin, can be Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche, you, you name it. So basically this way we are able to grow a large resource pool that is spread across the globe. In this way, we are able to maintain high availability, but in the same time, we cover the privacy in the off-chain part. So we are talking about maintaining transaction private while being in the pending state, uh, ensuring uh, privacy of metadata, behavior analytics, and all that stuff. That's amazing. Now, we've seen a lot of DAOs, but a lot there's been kind of funny memes going around that many DAOs aren't truly decentralized. Talk to us how you battle that, getting to that final decentralizing point especially with so much Web2 infrastructure needed to kind of organize and coordinate a lot of members of these DAOs. Yeah, so it is a very difficult problem. Uh, and, I, and I will say that the Shapeshift DAO is not fully decentralized today. Um, as part of uh, Shapeshift's transition from a centralized company into a DAO, uh, Shapeshift appointed the Fox Foundation, a brand new nonprofit organization designed to take custody of all the centralized pieces and with a mission of decentralizing each one until they are all fully decentralized and then to shut itself down. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we have right now is Shapeshift's reliance on centralized servers. Uh, whenever somebody visits shapeshift.com to plug in their wallet or uses the Shapeshift web app, they're connecting to Shapeshift owned servers on the back end. We run Bitcoin D, we run Geth, we run all the different blockchain servers that are needed to serve you the data that you need to deal with your, your crypto. Um, in order to decentralize that, Shapeshift is embarking on a mission to create something called FoxChain. FoxChain is a directory of open uh, blockchain nodes so that anybody can connect to any number of, of hundreds of nodes online to get the blockchain information they need without relying on centralized Shapeshift. And on the other side, if you know how to run Bitcoin D yourself, right now you can run it and you're, you're not getting any money for it. But with Foxchain, if you connect your Bitcoin D to the, uh, to the directory, you can now start earning money for serving blockchain data to the world. That's awesome. So even in decentralization, we still have a little centralization. Alex, your buster Christian was talking a little bit about that, about a lot of the centralization that still exists. How do you get your customers closer to decentralization and protecting their privacy while maintaining that compliance. Well, I think privacy and compliance are always two words which are hard to put together, right? But I think if you are able to do the dry run of transaction to make sure you can do granular checks, you can still maintain privacy, so allowing protocols with zero knowledge proofs 
but in the same time make sure you can enforce all the sanction lists that you can block and ban them in this way you are able to let the good guys pass through the privacy protocols but still ban all the bad people but there is a opening question here how you know the addresses which are sanctioned right so i think it's still an open challenge but we see a lot of progress that is being happening around so i think things are, are moving in the right direction that's awesome michael you've been in the canadian crypto market for a long time we've seen how much scams have plagued the canadian market can you talk us through maybe some consumer protection that you see is actually working I know you're part of C4, so education has been a big part of that. Is there any way you can see us mitigating a little bit more of the scams or deter some of the scams that are happening right now while maintaining users' privacy? Well, Stephen, you hit the nail on the head. The biggest hurdle to uh, everyone's security today is education. Um, because people are not uh, experts at dealing with uh, mnemonic seeds and private keys, they don't know the lessons of, you know, don't paste it into a web, a web application that you've never used before. They don't understand what you need to do to, uh, to keep things safe. Uh, C4 is tackling that head on with its educational uh, uh, materials, its educational programs, and the certified Bitcoin professional and certified Ethereum professional designations. Tell us a little bit about your recent release, because I think when we're seeing a lot of these DeFi hacks, security is a big deal, but there's not a lot of professionals that have captured the knowledge in security. Can you talk about your recent release of your certificate? Yeah, uh, as a board member of C4, I'm very proud of our executive director and her team uh, and, and the launch that they just went through a few days ago. Uh, ever since 2012, C4 has published an open source standard called the Cryptocurrency Security Standard, the CCSS. The CCSS uh, outlines 33 uh, controls that you should, uh, that every information system needs to have in order to protect against scammers, hackers, and to keep funds safe. Uh, just a few days ago, C4 released uh, a new auditor exam, the CCSSA, that uh, that asserts that someone understands the security standards so well that they are able to go out into other companies' uh, systems, audit them, and, and grade them as level one, level two, or level three against the security standard. Never before uh, has there been a, um, a, a exam like this or a certificate like this in the blockchain space, and I'm incredibly proud as a, uh, as a C4 board member that we've launched it. And we need it now more than ever. Alex, why don't you just talk us through lastly about, you know, everyone's thinking about on-chain, 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 investigations on-chain. Talk about some of the real off-chain threats that some of your customers are seeing and how you protect them from those. Yeah, so I think in general, off-chain uh, privacy risk are to fold it. So one is uh, security in the terms of physical security. It might be a bit far stretched, but we've seen cases where people were being kidnapped because bad guys were able to correlate metadata, IP address, geolocation towards their Ethereum address, for example. So they see whales, they see a huge wealth, and they were starting to correlate as much as data they can. That was is one risk, but it's also the risk of uh, financial reason because you can be front run if you are doing a transaction on a DeFi protocol. And I think the best comparison here is that if you would like to buy a large amount of apples in the market and someone knows that intention beforehand, it can go 10 minutes earlier and buy the entire supply and send you at a 10% premium. So I think that's a good comparison to have in mind. That's kind of the risk, uh, financial risk of losing money that you are exposing to if you're the off-chain privacy is lacking. This has been an amazing conversation. Michael, Alex, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your conference and good luck with everything with um, the DAO. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you as well.